go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Empowering Data Consumers to Deliver Business Value, sponsored today by Informatica. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested through out the webinar. And then let me introduce Susan Wilson from Informatica to kick off our speaker introductions and the webinar. Susan, hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon, and thank you to all of you at Dataversity. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Susan Wilson. I'm the Vice President of the Data Governance and Privacy segment with Informatica. Prior to joining Informatica about eight years ago, I was responsible for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals data management and data governance journey for nearly over a decade. And so I work with many of our customers worldwide to help them with their journey um, to realizing um, business value with data. Today I'm joined by a um, couple of experts that I work with very closely in the field. Uh, Ryan, we'll start with you with your introduction. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Glassnow. I am a data governance domain expert here at Informatica. Uh, similar to Susan, I also uh, came to Informatica as a practitioner. So, uh, you know, been in the shoes of, uh, of a lot of our customers and, and helping to stand up and operationalize uh, data governance program at several uh, Fortune 500 companies. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. Looking forward to today's session with you. Now over to Bridge from Deloitte. Bridge. Hey, thanks, Susan. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bridge Sharma. I'm part of uh, Deloitte's analytic and cognitive practice and primarily focus on data management services like master data management, data governance, and quality, and have been helping our clients to innovate and transform into insight-driven organi organizations. Uh, been uh, part of the Informatica family for almost 12 years now, uh, working on pretty much all of uh, the different products and solutions from Informatica. So excited to be here uh, and talk about data governance. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Bridge. And again, looking forward to partnering with you on today's session today. I know you've got some great stories to tell us about uh, practical use cases in the field. Thank you. All right, well, we've got a fantastic lineup today in terms of our learning objectives. Uh, we've developed, uh, the three of us developed this agenda primarily because we work with customers worldwide and what they tell us in terms of what the opportunities they have and some of the pain points that they're trying to overcome. And so this is a collection of what we're hearing in terms of best practices as well as um, real case studies that we've worked on in the field. So you'll hear us in terms of our panel discussion as well as materials that we're sharing in terms of um, where the challenges are for today's leaders and how we're seeing that role of the CDO expanding. And they're looking to build data as a second language and truly drive business value um, within their organizations and how they're overcoming that. Some of the top priorities are our capabilities that they're looking to implement and places that they're getting started. When we've hosted these roundtable sessions worldwide, um, we've got a series that we run. It's a close, intimate um, engagement with many of our chief data officers and data practitioners. They tell us that, look, delivering trusted data is challenging, and it's not getting easier, and it won't get any easier because we've got exponential growth facing us with the amount of move to digital uh, objectives that we've got within many organizations. Data is growing quite exponentially, and it's challenging. Many of us are uh, data, leader, data leaders and data practitioners because we've got a lot of untapped value. In fact, 55% of organizations' data is dark or unknown, and unknown and untagged. And we've also got, with that, um, some challenges in terms of knowing where our personal and sensitive data is stored. And that's about 57% of organizations that are citing that. That challenges us for not only our privacy regulations, but also data ethics. And then 60% of organizations still tell us that 
data quality is a challenge for them and its complexity. In fact, I've never met an organization that has said, I've got my quality issues covered. In fact, we're great with quality. In fact, most of them say um, that they're challenged with it and it actually is impeding their ability to drive business adoption and truly achieve value. And many of you have told us over the last few years that democratizing data is going to be critically important. Not just looking at enabling our IT or our technical um, specialists and analysts, but really looking at self-service to a broader consumer base of business consumers that are non-technical. And so self-service objectives are popping up quite extensively. And for many of you that are responsible for your organization's data strategy, the implementation, and the adoption, we're hearing that your role is also expanding. In years past, we heard you quite often citing that risk and compliance objectives were your number one priorities. But today, now more than ever, we're hearing self-service analytics, insights, uh, the ability to uh, drive business enablement, uh, digital transformation, business transformation objectives are top importance, and we're seeing things such as your programs of work um, with line of sight to revenue growth, revenue growth, operational efficiency, margin expansion, the ability to build a data-driven culture, and really getting everybody on board is, is um, top of mind for many of you, because many of you recognize, too, that Organizations that have the highest ability to break down those data silos are going to have the higher ability to innovate with strong data sharing practices. So being able to really build in a strong data practice is critical for many of you. And to double click and put an exclamation on that point, Data democratization is going to be something that you're looking to implement with the broad enterprise. It's not going to be solved by just um, a centralized team of, of data experts. You're really looking for data and consumption, data consumption by all, from your executive teams who are using it for um, driving the insights that help us to identify new areas or markets of growth or finding more operational efficiencies to your finance teams for financial planning and looking at that cross line of business data to help us get better at looking at um, how the organization is performing to marketing teams in terms of looking at that next best offer and looking at the cross sell upsell of your customer base as well as your procurement teams looking at areas of opportunity to drive better spend management to manufacturing teams in terms of looking at the effectiveness of of delivering to the supply chain and um, other ways of looking at operationalizing in our data science teams to helping them with data ops as well as our AI machine learning um, benefits. Because we recognize that data already exists in our organization. If you look at the outer rim of this circle here, um, we see many lines of business, business functions that um, are out there looking for data. And what they see on the inside are all of these disconnected systems, business processes, subject matter experts. And what we're looking to do is catalog our understanding, connect it with the business context, and enable those um, connections to happen. But we also need that data to be clean, to be accessible, to be prepared, and to be a, um, a available and trusted for our consumers. And the other thing is that our consumer base is also expanding. On that left-hand side is, is traditionally what we see in terms of our technical expertise, our data scientists, or data engineers, and ETL developers. They're uniquely positioned in terms of seeing the enterprise data and also understanding the challenges with integrating cross-line of business data and making it consumable to the business consumers over here on the right-hand side. And over here, we see some folks that um, are those citizen consumers and citizen analysts that have those important projects that they're working on to find the new insights to helping us identify new areas of market potential, operational efficiencies, and what their challenge with is that they don't have the technical capabilities to just have access to these back-end systems and to mesh up the data themselves. So they're really looking at self-service to giving them the ability to find data efficiently, to understand its trust and transparency, and to connect to the subject matter experts. And that population of those individuals is, is basically the full enterprise. 
and that's the challenge that many of you have highlighted in terms of the ability for data democratization. It's not only between the capabilities of providing the trusted data, but then also this, these consumers that are non-technical. So what I'd like to do is to bring in um, my two experts into a panel discussion and to talk about a bit more on the top business priorities. We've got about three questions. This first question here is, you know, what are some of the top business priorities and business projects we're seeing with um, data governance and cataloging today? So this first question here, I'm going to ask Ryan to chime in first, and then we'll bring in Bridge. So Ryan. Yeah, Susan, thanks. Um, I think, you know, when, when, when I see and think about the, the different, uh, you know, kind of business leaning uh, projects and priorities, I kind of break these down into, uh, into three overall buckets um, as, a, as a part of this. Um, the first one, you know, I think about, um, you know, the analytics space and the need for uh, rapid acceleration within the space, helping to uh, increase the overall service delivery, making it easier for those end users to be able to find and understand and really kind of trust that end-to-end -end lineage across the overall enterprise as a part of that. Uh, a good example is a customer that we work with at uh, George Washington uh, University. One of the things that they wanted to do was be able to turn actionable insights uh, around the student data, primarily focused around retention, enrollment, uh, financial performance. And so, uh, and using that, that really helped to lead to a uh, reduction in overhead as well as accelerating uh, the report compilation um, and saving as much as uh, 100 uh, person hours uh, per month. Um, other areas that I'm seeing a lot of focus in right now, um, especially in times uh, with, uh, with COVID, is, is around uh, customer retention um, and how do they really kind of help not only just uh, initial customer retention, but really kind of creating that customer lifetime. Uh, connection and that experience there, um, and a great one that we work with there is a uh, healthcare company, and what they wanted to do was to be able to uh, provide uh, more full spectrum services around um, the lifelong health journey um, of their customers, and so this was taking a um, kind of a, 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 an older traditional insurance-based approach to that um, and turning it into um, the ability to bring in things from, from further acquisitions to gain better understanding of that and really use the data governance team to be the glue um, to help align for the understanding of that data, the monitoring of the policies, uh, and the overall trusting uh, of the data and making sure that that was being delivered um, to the right people um, at the right time to, um, to help gain that view of their customer base. Um, and then the last one, um, and, and you hit on this earlier in the slide, Susan, is around uh, data privacy. Um, you know, this is mm -hmm. this is a this is a big uh, thing that, that organizations are looking at right now in terms of you know GDPR was was really top of mind in 2018, and now we're looking at uh, CCPA. Um, but customers are also taking a um, much more kind of just focus uh, around that. You know, 69% of global customers are prepared to boycott a company if they don't feel that protection is being taken very seriously uh, around that. So um, this is a this is a big area of approach that we're seeing um, our customers come in and helping to prioritize and, and really using um, these different types of uh, regulatory uh, data policies to um, help get their governance program off the ground. Ryan, great insights. In fact, you just described that two-sided coin because you started in by the customer focus, but then also looking at the um, the balance of the privacy regulations and even ethics these days, too, in terms of um, how we're planning to use the data. So um, thank you for sharing those insights. Bridge, I'd like to bring you in on this one. And so um, please um, add to what you're seeing with the business priorities in today's, um, in today's world. Sure. Uh, so I think we see very similar priorities, what Ryan mentioned, right? Revenue growth and cost, re cost reduction and corporate governance uh, are some of the key priorities that we see across uh, industry sectors, right? Uh, as companies are looking towards innovating their go-to-market strategies to innovate, to increase their revenue and cost uh, and reduce costs, uh, we see data playing a very key role in helping them become an insight-driven organization, right? For example, uh, two of our large tech sector clients, uh, they're looking at increasing and optimizing their channel uh, or partner sales, right? So how they're 
looking at it as transforming their insight and analytics generation and delivering them in real time to the right stakeholders to make them more actionable, right? Like providing a complete 360 view of their customers to not only their sales reps, but also their uh, partner account executives to help improve with their win rate or retention and renewal for their customers, right? Now for achieving this, the C organizations are playing very important role in, in ensuring trusted high quality data is available throughout the value chain, right? Not only in their analytics platform, but across their value chain uh, in their source applications all the way to uh, your analytics platform. Right, and then the second thing, as Ryan mentioned, corporate governance and privacy, that's taking center stage. Uh, with new stricter risk regulations and data privacy requirements, corporate governance is becoming more and more important. Uh, again, similar example for tech sector with COVID, uh, most of our online or as a service provider organizations, they've seen exponential growth in a very short span. Uh, that that's leading to higher risk of exposure and uh, breaches and threats, right? So what they're looking for is tighter governance controls for securing their data assets. And uh, like that starts with defining their sensitive data, knowing where it exists, and then identifying gaps where they might have exposure. So very similar themes is that we see across the industry sectors. Very good. Thanks so much for sharing that, Bridge. Um, corporate governance, uh, of course, being um, top of mind for many organizations, especially as we start to bring and break down those data silos and, and taking a look at, at the data that we have. Thank you for that. Bridge, in fact, I'd like to keep you um, on the second question, um, which, which is around what are some of the priorities and capabilities, the capabilities that organizations are looking to implement in terms of addressing those business objectives and outcomes that um, both you and Ryan just cited. So um, I'm going to use this slide as our backdrop um, for the conversation. So, Bridge. Sure. Uh, I'll continue on the same theme, right? Based on some of these business priorities and outcomes that we uh, just talked about, there are a variety of capabilities that organizations are looking at. Uh, managing master data across various domains, be it customer partner, product, practitioners, or agents, that continues to be a table state capability, right? However, what we see as a shift is that organizations are now looking at next-gen capabilities, uh, like integrating social media feeds into their customer masters or uh, master data management systems, right? Or AI and ML uh, capabilities for use cases like uh, sentiment analysis, right? Yeah. Uh, second, what we see for organizations to provide more actionable and trusted insights, metadata management, both business and technical, including uh, cataloging and creating a clear end-to-end -end lineage of the data flow, that has seen tremendous traction across industries. Right? Uh, data management communities and users, be it your business analysts, ETL writers, or on the extreme end, your data scientists, they want to spend least amount of time finding the data or worrying about if they can trust the data they have uh, and instead spend time on generating insights or creating new predictive models for business to act upon, right? So those two areas, we definitely see a lot of traction. Uh, then the third area we see definitely is data privacy management, right? Organizations want to look at or identify what their vulnerable spots are and then how can they put more controls uh, and governance in securing uh, data, not at just, uh, and uh, I'll use more technical term here, right, both from data at rest as well as data in motion, right? How can they secure and avoid, uh, you know, a situation where they have exposure? So those are some of the key capabilities based on business priorities that we see. Mm, very good, Bridge. And yes, I, I'm hearing those same things as well. Of course, we're working very closely with both our customers jointly and having um, the ability to have these capabilities integrated is critically important for um, for that speed and reduction of risk and lower total cost of, cost of ownership. Um, Ryan, I'd like to also bring you in on this because you, of course, work with many of our customers worldwide in terms of 
um, core capabilities. What are you seeing? Yeah, thanks, Susan. I, you know, I think one of the things I, I, that I really love about uh, data governance is there's so many different entry points uh, that you can come into uh, as a part of the governance program, and it's kind of represented um, on the slide here. And you know, what we're hearing with an organization. Um, is really, you know, they're looking to be able to apply the, the automation to help enable their business. And when I'm talking about business, I'm talking about, you know, the, the people and the process piece of this, um, you know, and, and marrying that up to the data. So that way they have a better opportunity to be able to scale to the success of their new modern uh, data environments that, that, that they're looking at. And so, um, you know, similar to uh, what, what Bridge was talking about, you know, when we think about things with, um, you know, GDPR and CCPA, right? How do you begin to automate the discovery um, and classification of that PII data, um, tying that into a policy and, and then uh, also then assigning ownership and accountability um, a, as a part of this. And so then, you know, when you kind of continue down that path, you're thinking around, you know, all right, well now how do I begin to apply um, data quality um, looking at these policies? Um, Susan, you mentioned the beginning uh, of the uh, of the presentation uh, around uh, the fact that uh, you know 60% of organizations are still continuing to be challenged with data quality. Well, now how do we bring data quality into our uh, regulatory uh, piece of that? Um, you know, making sure that you have the appropriate rules that are lined up to the policy to be able to cleanse and enrich that data, um, and then you know, and then um, carry on to what what Bruce was talking about around you know master data. Um, right, making sure that you have the processes there to help embed the enforcement um, of those as they are going into the overall uh, master data um, component of that. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the slide is a, just a really great representation of what we're really kind of hearing of where different organizations kind of based on the maturity and their use cases are choosing to enter into um, an overall uh, governance program. Yeah, Brian, right, spot on. Uh, you know, the other thing that I also love about this, to your point, I'm just going to put an exclamation point on it, is the per different personas that we're engaging here, that this isn't going to be solved by just a centralized team of data experts. It's, it's really engaging the full enterprise um, when it comes to, to, to democratizing data, and they all play a role, and it's critically important that we give them the proper capabilities and the experiences um, to truly engage in, you know, a centralized platform of shared um, data and metadata. And that's, um, you know, basically the source of truth there. So, good stuff. Yeah. All absolutely. right, Ryan, I'm going to... Absolutely. Oh, go ahead. I, and, and if I can just kind of make one more point on that. You know, I, I think, you know, part of it, too, is it, it, it's not a one-time project. As, as people are really kind of looking at this or as an initiative as a part of that and, and you know, expanding on, you know, there's, you know, all of these different personas that are involved, but it's, it's changing in a way the, the role. So there's that change management piece that comes in to the roles that are a part of that overall end-to-end -end process of that data pipeline, um, you know, of being able to treat that data as, you know, trusted governed data. Um, supporting all of this, right? It's not just a, a one-time activity and then people go back to um, to the way things were prior to. Exactly, which is why we focus a lot on operationalizing it so we could reduce, you know, the, uh, the simple documentation aspects and the aspects that um, oftentimes crush these teams and focus on the real insights and value of data. Um, very good. Thanks so much, Ryan. In fact, let's stay with you for the second question because this is also going to be very important for us um, to talk about, which is where are programs getting started today with data governance? And what are you finding are some of those high value targets from a project perspective? Because this is, this is about change management. This is not just about a tool implementation. It's also about um, getting those, I call it the aha moments, <laughs> and building the muscle memory into the teams um, in terms of what data governance can truly do for an enterprise. So this, um, this next slide is basically, you know, the backdrop of, you know, think big, start small, scale fast. Um, so Ryan, I'm going to stick with you on this particular question. Where are you seeing um, customers getting started today? Yeah. Um you know, I, I, again, kind of similar to the last slide, you know, we're seeing them come in from, from a variety of, of, um, of different uh, angles as a part of this. But I think, you know, the, the key thing to the success of 
these governance programs is making sure that it is anchored into a key strategic business driver. And we talked about some of those different business drivers that we're seeing, um, you know, uh, across the, the industry globally um, as, a, as a part of this, but it's really making sure that you have that anchored into that piece of it. And then, you know, kind of tying into the slide, it really is as, as simple as it, as it seems is, you know, thinking big, starting small and scaling fast, but creating that repeatable process, right? Kind of thinking about, you know, what are the things that are gonna have the, you know, highest value, um, but lowest level of effort in order to achieve that and making sure that you're beginning to get those wins quickly and early on because the focus in organizations, especially of how quickly they're moving in today's current environment, um, you know, people aren't going to have the patience to wait 6, 12, 18 months to see um, results yielding from an overall governance program. So by kind of using this, um, this blueprint, if you will, um, you know, I think that that's really where we're seeing, you know, having some of those smaller use cases coming in, building that, and then having that repeatable process that you can use um, in order to help scale that uh, across the enterprise by bringing, you know, people in, um, you know, one at a time. Um, in, in my prior role before coming to Informatica, um, you know, I was leading a governance program, um, reviving it actually, a failed governance program as a part of that. Um, and my goal coming in there was to go ahead and find where are we seeing um, the overlap across the different use cases within the, um, within the different organizations um, across the enterprise that we can then hone in on. So we're making sure that we're creating kind of that enterprise value and we're not making, uh, we're not creating uh, solutions that are just gonna be niche for an individual line of business, but something that can be represented across all of those lines and then bringing those people in and then scaling it um, kind of as a, as a part of that. No, that's great, Ryan. Very, very good. Um, Bridge, I'd like to bring you in on this question too. You're focused quite heavily on implementation and um, we always put in some of these great plans in terms of, you know, what the roadmap looks like and we're looking at incrementally releasing value to the organization because this is going to be done in a big bang approach. Um, so how are you, what, what are you seeing and how are you helping customers to help them think through um, their roadmap for getting started? Uh, absolutely. So how we look at, uh, you know, from a starting data governance organizations or data governance programs, right? It always needs to start with defining your data strategy that aligns with your organization's strategic priorities or initiatives, right? What we tell our clients, uh, your goal should not be solved, should be solving a business problem using data and not solving a, a data problem. Right. We see variety of uh, priorities across different industries like uh, customer centricity for insurance, uh, banking and capital market, or improving your 360 view for both uh, providers and members for life sciences and healthcare, or, or for that matter in the tech sector as well, right? A customer 360 view or a partner 360 view. Those are some of the key uh, areas where our clients are investing to improve either their revenue, reduce cost, or improve operational efficiency, right? So when you define your data governance initiative, your data strategy needs to enable these business outcomes, right? So that's your first step, uh, what we tell our client. Next step is to look at what are the data management or CDO services you would need uh, to focus that will help solve for or accelerate some of these business outcomes, right? And solve some of the key business pain points, uh, right? So these could be capabilities, uh, should you focus first on your master data management or is data quality your key issue, which is, uh, you know, impeding business to achieve operational, uh, operational efficiencies, right? Now, the other aspect, what uh, Susan, you and Ryan mentioned about is definitely uh, you need to keep in mind that you have to start small, right? Align, define your business strategy uh, based on your organization's priorities, but start small. Look at where those quick wins are that can quickly, uh, you know, provide value to the business, uh, prove success of gov uh, governance programs, 
and then continue to scale, right? Continue to scale within the business functions across the enterprise, and that then it becomes a repeatable process. And, uh, you know, it also enforces that data-driven culture within the organization, right? Uh, now, to take an example uh, similar to what Ryan mentioned, right, we, we were working with our uh, real estate or uh, REIT client, the real estate uh, investment trust client, right? They were looking at uh, basically starting a data governance program across the enterprise, across all their business functions and business units. But they took a very academic approach to it, right? They started defining what are our governance charters, what, what should be the operating model look like. And, you know, from the get go, they did not have any business buy-in or business loss interest, right? Uh, when we uh, started engaging, we flipped the conversation around. Instead of looking how you need to organize yourself, first look at what is the business problem you're trying to solve, right? For them, data quality was the, one of the big issues, right? So we started with a very small initiative uh, around solving their data quality issue first. That then led to, uh, you know, quick wins, quick impacts on their business process, and then that became a repeatable process to expand it to other business functions, other geographies, uh, became a very successful data governance uh, program, right? So, uh, as you mentioned, think big, start small, and then scale it up, make it repeatable. That rate example is just so important because oftentimes organizations are at their second, their third, or their fourth attempt at data governance because I think that what they focus is almost too much on just the charter, the organization structure, the roles and responsibilities, and not the with them, what's in it for me, meaning the people that are going to have to engage and um, be a part of this program, they're not thinking about it in terms of what's the value to my organization and how do I articulate that value in clear terms. And so that REIT example that you just provided was spot on and uh, it's, it's critical because what you want to do, like you want the momentum to continue to build on each and every one of these examples because it's going to then expand to more teams, you know, knocking on your door saying, I want this too, I want to engage, I want to be a part of that. Um, because governance isn't about slowing people down. It's really about engaging your enterprise, being able to really start to connect the dots across all of these rich subject matter experts and this rich data that you have within the organization to truly democratize it. And so um, critically important that your roadmap builds in um, the with them, um, those business objectives and how we're going to achieve those. So thanks so much for sharing that, Bridge. That was, that was powerful. And one Great. other thing with that, Susan, I would, I would say oh, yeah. that it almost becomes a, a bit of a, a self-funding organization, you know, after a while, yeah. right? You talked about the, the, the with them and, and how organizations will then begin to actually knock on the door um, of your actual program, what you're trying to do versus going out there and trying to actually sell that value because people have seen the, you know, the cost savings, the time savings, um, you know, being able to um, solve those different uh, business initiatives um, that, that Bridge was talking about versus data challenges. Um, and so it makes it much easier going forward to be able to request, you know, that funding for maybe additional headcount or additional um, technology as you begin to mature as part of your program. Exactly, exactly. In fact, that is a fantastic segue to um, bringing us to, I want to share a bit more about uh, an, a, a live use case that we worked with many customers. In fact, you're going to see this through um, a bit of an overview and demonstration of these capabilities in action because what you're hearing from both Bridge as well as Ryan is that, look, we've got a broad set of business objectives. And we also have to serve a very broad base within our enterprise. And with that, you don't have a whole lot of time. You don't have a lot of opportunity to take some risks. 
um, with, um, with these use cases and these capabilities. And so um, what Informatica offers is something truly that helps organizations to, um, to get there faster, faster in terms of um, delivering on those business drivers and outcomes. So let's take a look at this short video and then we'll also bring it to summary and then stay tuned. We're about to also enter our Q&A as well. So um, hang on and let's uh, take a look at this quick video here. For the purposes of this demo, I will take on the role of Rosie to work for analytics. Rosie comes into Axon to receive tasks within her analytics project team, as well as finding it a good place to understand and contextualize data. This is why she has these dashboards in view. One is related to retail in general, an overview from corporate that has been shared with her. The next is configured to focus on analytics, a key place where Rosie and her colleagues keep an eye on the best available data. Finally, there is her own personal dashboard, which is strict to show her actions and interests. Her open task widget is showing that she has an overdue task, so she better investigate. By clicking into this task, Rosie can see that her project manager has nominated her as taking on this duty to find the best available customer data. Rosie knows she has a widget saved of the published customer data set, so she returns to her dashboard to view it. By clicking into this widget, Rosie is isolating the relevant data sets and will only see the ones that have been published and contain customer data. She can then choose to see a scoped map of these to make her decision by clicking into Map. She can even expand this map to make sure she will be able to see all of the relevant details on one screen. Rosie should consider how this map has been scoped. The orange icons represent the systems with the published data sets that she was seeking, so she would ignore the black ones for her purposes. By adding the attributes overlay and the physical field addition, Rosie can begin to get an idea of what data these systems contain and begin to think about what would be most useful. She will also immediately rule out the Tableau report, as aside from having limited data, it also does not link to the underlying physical fields via EDC, so it may be more difficult to gain access to. The data quality check shows that there are no rules on the till system at the start, so she would like to bypass this as well. Also, it looks like it has incomplete data as opposed to MDM. Finally, Rosie adds the privacy overlay to ensure she understands the protections around this data. MDM does have protections in place, but she should still be able to use the data for analytics in an anonymized manner. Rosie has made her decision. Based on this context, she will request access to the MDM customer data. To do just that, Rosie will move into the marketplace area so that she can locate this data and request access to it through the official governed route. She knows the data set is in retail customer MDM, so narrows down her search to focus on this system. Once she has located the data collection in question, she can click into it to understand more about what she will be receiving and do some additional checks before requesting the data. One of the things she wants to check is the data quality. It looks good in general, but there is an issue with the transaction ID. As this is not direct customer data that she needs, Rosie doesn't worry about this for her purposes. Next, Rosie will check the delivery options to make sure that she can have a copy made of the data and provision to her via EDC so that she can manipulate it as she wishes. Her final check is on the policies. They seem to be as she expected, as she's dealing with personal data, so she has no concerns in agreeing to them. Rosie is now happy to check this data out kicking off the process of it being provisioned to her. Rosie is happy to justify her request as she knows this project has the company's attention right now. She also expresses her preference for EDC provisioning and requests this in the comments box as well to make sure. Rosie agrees to the terms of use related to handling the personal data and anonymizing where necessary. These are standard requests that she is going to PPA and she is used to entering into this kind of data sharing agreement. Rosie then submits her order, happy that she has kicked off this relevant task, and it will soon be picked up by the appropriate owners to action. She can keep track of its status in the My Orders section of Marketplace, 
and will do so until she is updated and can get to work on her customer analytics project. All right, very good. Um, so, so the first, let me just move on from that. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and then now um, start to bring us home in terms of the uh, summary as well as closing comments, and then we'll get into the Q&A in just a few minutes. But in summary, data, the data landscape is certainly changing and it's also becoming challenging. It's not gonna get easier for us. And so, uh, the exponential growth of data, as well as about a third of the organizations still don't know where their sensitive data is. And that's challenging them in terms of not only the privacy, but also the ethical use of data. Um, the other thing that we heard on today's call by our panel, as well as what we're hearing worldwide, is that data democratization truly drives business value, and that the CDO role is no longer just tied to just risk and compliance. It's looking at some of those broader business objectives and truly building in a data-driven culture, really bringing everybody on board. And that 80% of organizations are also shifting to a self-service model by 2024. And so many of you are being getting prepared for that, as well as starting to incrementally um, build out your roadmaps to address this um, this opportunity. And some of these top opportunities for capabilities is that data is really embedded as a part of the business strategy and that we're also investing significantly in AI and in machine learning around data consumption. So critical capabilities that we heard on today's call, things such as being able to bring in a marketplace for data, being able to also um, really bring on board our full enterprise to help us not only for visibility with cataloging, building transparency and trust with, a, uh, with quality, and also helping us to secure um, our most um, important data with privacy. And so those are, those are top of mind. So uh, with that being said, um, we'll go ahead and um, get with um, the the um, questions that we have at hand. And actually, before we do that, I just wanted to say that let us also help you with advisory and consulting um, services. We've got a broad set of opportunities for us to engage you across both Deloitte, the partnership with Deloitte and Informatica. We can help you with um, that business case development, road mapping, helping you with um, business adoption as well as technical adoption, as well as platform implementation, a whole host of different sorts of services that will help um, your organization to succeed. And then if you're like many of us that are also binge watching quite a bit of things that are on um, the digital platform, we also have our binge worthy channel of our customer stories that um, we call it our data empowerment series. In fact, you'll hear from customers like New New York Life, UNC, Genworth, um, Invesco, that have told their stories from our data champions, where they started, where they're going with their program, how they've been able to overcome challenges and le leverage Informatica and our partner um, in terms of helping them to achieve business outcomes. In fact, you'll see um, also UNC Health is a great one too because we did talk quite a bit about anchoring your programs to top line business objectives and having that executive sponsorship. UNC Health, um, uh, Ratchini Masavi talked about how she built her program from the ground up and looked at incremental projects. So we've got basically a story that um, has uh, quite a few dynamics that will help you with um, helping you with your program. And then um, please feel free to connect with us over LinkedIn as well as over email in case you um, would like to get further information from us, um, from those that presented today on the call and as well as our Informatica experts. Okay, Shannon, I'm going to go ahead and turn it now over to you for open Q&A. Thank you, everybody, for this great presentation. It's been a great discussion. Thanks for facilitating, Susan. And Thanks to everybody for joining us so far. Just to answer the most commonly asked questions, or if you have questions for everybody, please do submit them in the in the Q and A section in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, and to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder: I will send a follow up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, um, data sharing is, data sharing is showing up a lot in conversation with CDOs. What are some examples? Great, thanks so much. I think, Ryan, we're going to go ahead and turn that question over to you. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, um, Shannon, for for that question. You know, I think you know examples that that we're seeing, and, and it was just working with a um, with a customer on this specifically around um, self service analytics. And, and Susan mentioned, you know, eighty percent of organizations are shifting to the self service uh, model uh, by by twenty twenty four, kind of moving away from that uh, previous uh, IT centric model uh, as a part of that. Um, but where we're really seeing a focus in here and, and kind of tying it back to this use case was just the plethora of requests that thinking about a BI or an analytics team is receiving across the organization for very similar reports and people not knowing where to go, really kind of thinking about that end user uh, within an organization of being able to find relevant data that is important to uh, to their roles. And so, uh, you know, when we're really kind of talking about that ability to self-service our data, um, that's kind of an example of what we're seeing is creating that platform of a trusted repository of reports where that non-technical user has the ability to go in there, have that seamless user experience, finding data, understanding the data, seeing what it means across the organization, understanding the data quality um, of that data as well, and then being able to go through uh, a simple checkout process and then having that uh, um, that data then provisioned uh, for them to be able to uh, to access. And so that's something that really kind of on, on this one around, you know, the, the data sharing and um, and the, um, the the value that they're trying to get out of that um, is, is really trying to um, save a significant amount of time and then also allowing that, uh, that BI and the analytics team to really focus on additional value-added activities within their organization. Right. And just to add to that, uh, Ryan, you know, how you explained it, all of these capabilities are now helping uh, business functions across the value chain, right? Uh, unblock new insights that can be more actionable, right? For example, back in the day, uh, order management data or support tickets and support issues data uh, wasn't readily available for your sales reps to look at, right? There was uh, different ownership, how, where the data is, what report should they be using uh, at, right? Now, making the data shareable, readily available, sales organizations are running reports and generating their own insight using data across the value chain, right? What it uh, results as an outcome, the sales rep is already able to see what the customer owns, what are the, some of the key issues that they have with the products, or uh, what trainings have the customer taken? Where is my cross-sell, upsell opportunity, right? And that's helping sales reps have more personal conversation uh, or more, uh, you know, conversation that is more impactful for either renewing or upselling, cross-selling to their customer. So, uh, you know, sharing data across your different business functions, organizations, that, that's unblocking newer and newer uh, optimizations across your value chain. That, that's a great example, Bridge, and that actually, that actually reminds me of a um, of a use case that I was working on uh, back in, in in my prior role as part of the governance organization. Um, similar to what you're talking about with the sales organization and and, and allowing that um, you know account manager to have that understanding of what's going into their accounts. But you know another great example of that was you know from the opportunity to cross sell and upsell, but making sure as you're going in and having a conversation that it's not getting derailed, for example, of, hey, well, we've had 15 support issues that have been outstanding for the last X period of time, and the conversation completely pivots from the ability to cross-sell and upsell to more triage uh, with, with the customer. So being able to have all additional uh, insight around uh, the customer is, is extremely um, helpful to be proactive in, in nurturing that relationship. That's great, Ryan. Susan, anything you want to add to that? Oh, no, I just saw a great question coming in from Doug Graham um, regarding um, access requests. Maybe, Shannon, you could do the honors of asking the question. Sure. Uh, so when we change from a system-based access request to a data set-based access request, what are the major changes that need to be considered and what capabilities need to be in place to support the conversation? Yeah, I like this question. Um, maybe I'll start and then I'd, I'd like my uh, fellow panelists to weigh in. When we think about 
getting access requests at the data level, it's going to be critically important is that we think about that business context to data. So not only do I need to understand it from a physical perspective, but you know, what is, where did this data come from? Like from what, which, which business processes, you know, what are the sub, who are the subject matter experts that are going to be important to us? Um, to um, to basically uh, connecting to understanding this data. The other thing is to also be able to um, understand um, the importance around the quality and the transparency of this data collection. Is it appropriate for us to use um, at this point in time? And so important for us is to have that context around the, on the business angle, the technical angle, the quality angles, and to be able to provide an efficient process for facilitating that data, that data request. Because this is oftentimes those individuals that are in that line of business that are non-technical, um, and we need to make it easy for them to understand that they've, um, they're requesting access to the right data and that they can seek to understand more about it if they choose to do so. Um, maybe Ryan or Bridge, anything else to add on to that? Yeah, Susan, I, I think, you know, and, and even more particular at the at the data set level, uh, because multiple organizations, you know, thinking about an ERP uh, tool or something along those lines are all um, using um, that tool, but yet the ability and kind of access control around the particular data um, attributes or, or elements within there might not necessarily be appropriate for those users. So being able to see um, you know, how that data is actually being used uh, across different uh, organizations. So is it something from a financial perspective? Uh, a, a great example of this is um, a process that I put into place when I was at uh, Microsoft standing up their uh, governance organization um, in, in corporate finance was uh, when the Microsoft Surface initially um, came out, uh, Microsoft immediately became a competitor with their OEMs in this case. And so now all of a sudden, you could not have, even though it was in the same system, you could not have certain people having access to service data and vice versa into data uh, against the, uh, the OEMs on the overall financial performance of that. So I think that's kind of an example of same system, but it needs to be broken out um, by uh, that data set access for the individual and their um, roles and responsibilities within the uh, organization. Great point. Yep. I think we're, we're seeing a shift from you know, users saying I have access to this application, this table, this column, uh, rather than you know moving to then moving towards saying I have access to our sales data or I have access to our opportunity data. Right? That mm -hmm. is more curated. It has more business context added to it. I'm looking at our opportunity win rate rather than saying I'm looking at this table, this column in my Salesforce instance, right? Uh, I think so that that's a shift that we're seeing. What this uh, and to get there is again what you mentioned, uh, Susan. You need to catalog your data. You need to add business context to it. You need to add uh, the trust factor, so the quality uh, to it, so that your end user, which is your either data scientist, business analyst, ETL developer, they're not uh, struggling at looking at tables, columns, trying to make sense of the data, but they're looking at, uh, you know, a, a final uh, product that they can start using into their reports of insight generation. Great point. You know, we had a couple of questions come in earlier on. You guys covered this a little bit, but just want to just dive in a, a bit more here. At what level is data catalog tagged to data glossary, whether at logical or physical model layer? And then just add on to that, you know, how is data dictionary being addressed in order to address the data lineage part? Not sure who wants to jump in there. <laughs> Yep, I can take that one and bridge. Maybe you can add to it. So it's critically important that the business language gets um, appropriately associated to the technical understanding. And so that automation is, is important. And in fact, um, you know, through the video, one of the things that was highlighted is the automatic business glossary associations because, you know, that activity might require, for example, a DBA, an architect, a data modeler to be able to understand 
for example, um, customer ID maps to miscellaneous text one, you know, in a table in some in some foreign database. So um, the business glossary associations are critically important for that transparency and understanding, and that so that does need to happen at that level from business to technical, and then that helps us with uh, the lineage and understanding because at the same time I'm also harvesting the technical metadata that gives me a sense of the source to target the transformation logic. And that um, also gives a, a richer understanding for both the business and the technical in terms of, is this the proper data that I'm looking for? Is this the data that I expected? Is there other, are there other data sources? This also helps um, with impact analysis when I am looking at changing um, my data landscape and need to appropriately notify those individuals that um, that are impacted. Perhaps maybe I'm moving, you know, to a, a SaaS solution. Maybe I am decommissioning things. That uh, importance of us in terms of being able to manage our data states are, are critically important for that business to technical mapping. And that's uh, key. Bridge, anything to add on to that? No, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Good. Like, oh, good. Uh, I think we, we definitely need to start with your business glossary, what are the critical data elements, what are their business context or business definitions, and then go into looking at your technical metadata. Where do they, where do these critical data elements exist, right, across your different applications in the landscape, right? Uh, what are the different, uh, how is that data in those applications? So looking at your data quality then next, right? So. Uh, Starting with business definition, then looking at your technical metadata and then creating the lineage. How is this data flowing from uh, across your value chain from one system to another uh, for all the different use cases you mentioned? The impact assessment, uh, technical migrations, business transformation programs, right? Cataloging, lineage, both business and technical metadata, that makes the impact assessment so much easier uh, rather than doing the research. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and you guys have, have done just a tremendous job explaining, you know, how things are, are related and, and impact analysis and assessment of, of looking at that. But I think there's a, there's a big underlying piece that organizations are looking for in order to get started with this, and that's really around the ability to automate uh, those pieces that uh, you both have spoken about and leveraging the different, um, you know, artificial intelligence and the machine learning that is out there now that really helps to accelerate and operationalize um, those different uh, capabilities that, uh, that the organizations are looking to drive. Exactly, yeah. So uh, where can I find more information on any prerequisites for data provisioning via EDC referenced here? Hey, Shannon, were you so we can certainly um, yes. we, we can certainly send that um, out um, afterwards as far as um, links to additional documentation uh, around um, you know the enterprise data catalog um, and those different uh, prerequisites um, support of that. I love it. Yeah. Anything additional? I can put that in the follow up email that goes out. And uh, so diving in here, uh, I think we've got time for one more question. So where did the phrase uh, data uh, democratization come from? Uh, democracy makes people in organizations think of voting, of course. Um, most organizations do not vote on who data owners are or vote on what system is in the system or of record or how to calculate sales. Um, the term causes many people angst in organizations. Uh, you know, it, are organizations moving to popular voting of definitions, quality measures, and people are who are responsible for the data or for data, or is there any more insight on the term, which is becoming more popular? So I'll take that one, and then I'd like to turn it over to my panelists. But uh, the, I think of it not so much as voting. I think about it to that point about visibility and transparency, making it understandable to everyone in the enterprise. I mean, we're not leaving anybody behind when it comes to building data as a second language within the enterprise. And so, um, and, and while, and, and that means 
I make it transparent, the transparent, transparent, so they can find the data. They can also request access to it. They can connect to the subject matter experts. But they can also comment on the data. I wouldn't say while there might be some voting features in terms of like a Yelp rating for data, the ability for us to comment on it and to build a community around um, collaboration is is what we're seeing. Um, the definition of around data democratization. Um, Ryan, would you like to add anything or bridge? Yeah, I think um, that, you know, that's a great point. And, you know, I, I really kind of think of it as, as being able to provide broader access to uh, data and really trying to help eliminate those different barriers um, to access that exist um, today, right? Helping to streamline that overall process as a, as a part of that. Um, and then allowing, um, as Susan said, you know, that, that access to, um, to that data and the understanding of what that data means within the, uh, within the organization, but certainly not to, meant to create a, um, you know, a, a bureaucracy uh, around um, data. Right. All right, well, that does bring us to the top of the hour. Thank you again so much uh, for this great presentation and thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do, we just love it. Uh, again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks everybody and I hope everybody has a great day and stay safe out there. And thanks to Informatica for sponsoring today's webinar. Thanks all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Bridge. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.